Sir Caledon's home was in the distant port city of Venturum on the eastern coast of the kingdom. With no need to hurry, it took us quite a while to travel the distance, and it was the first time I had ever seen the vast territory controlled by the throne of Athala firsthand. It was quite impressive. Sir Caledon was a strict but fair man, and we got along well enough. I applied myself to my duties as well as I was able, but I admit, initially, it appeared to me that this life wasn't going to be any better than the one I'd just left. Caring for the horses, washing clothes, preparing meals, and caring for his equipment may have been different than the drudgery at home, but it was still mindless drudgery and I found myself just as unsatisfied. Fortunately, my discontent didn't last long. When we finally arrived at his keep in Venturum, I was pleasantly surprised to find that he had provided a tutor for me. In addition to what would become my normal duties, I was taught to read and my world finally became a whole lot bigger. I was instructed in mathematics, history, battlefield strategy, heraldry, the Knight's Code of Honor, and so many other things that would likely bore you to death to hear about. The particular subject mattered little to me. It was the learning that I loved, and I found myself interested no matter the subject. He praised me as gifted, but to be honest, I think my only real gift was curiosity. I absorb things because I simply want to know. I do not consider that gifted. At least not in the same way you might consider people like Einstein, Tesla, Aristotle, or Descartes. Men like that discover or expound upon new ideas. Things previously not considered or connections previously unknown. I had done nothing of that sort. I simply learned what someone else taught me. No matter how quickly or how well such information is retained, I wasn't breaking any new ground. At the time, my real passion came in the afternoons spent learning to fence and to fight. Sir Caledon proved to be a strict but patient teacher, and we quickly progressed through the basics. He became equally impressed with what he called my other gift. Though it was allowed, I never asked for breaks during our sessions. No matter how winded or tired I clearly was, I simply would not stop unless he made me. He referred to it as determination. He was far too kind. In reality, it was just stubbornness. What concerned him, and what became the focus for many of his lessons, was my natural tendency to rush. When running errands or something of that nature, it's perfectly fine to rush. To get things done as quickly as possible is a desirable thing, but in battle, sometimes patience is your best friend. When your enemy is making a mistake, it is best to stand aside and let him, he told me. It was this concept that was most difficult for me. While I understood it, I could not force myself to do it. While fencing, over and over again, his wooden blade at my neck would demonstrate my error, and yet as soon as we'd reset and begun a new round, I would charge in and find the same blade poised at my throat again. Ironically, it seemed that my impatience tried Sir Caledon's patience the most. One morning, instead of training, Sir Caledon sent me out to a small pond nearby. He said, the cooks will prepare whatever you bring back, but your dinner is at the pond. This was quite odd. For all the time I had been with him, I had never had to fill the dinner table. Prepare meals, yes. Serve meals, even. But supply them? No. So I gathered up a fishing rod and set out toward the pond that day quite puzzled. I spent hours that day with a hook in the water. I tried all along the north bank, but when dusk came, I had caught nothing. So it was with some disappointment that I returned to the keep and discovered that Sir Caledon was indeed serious. There was no dinner prepared for me, and none would be. Your dinner is at the pond, he reminded me. The next morning, he was nice enough to allow me a small breakfast, but his instruction for the day was the same. Your dinner is at the pond, he said again as he disappeared into his study. I took the rod, and this time I tried the west bank. The west bank of the pond got more sunlight than the north bank. The water there would be warmer, and I convinced myself that meant the fish would naturally congregate on that side. I tried up and down the west bank all day, and yet again, when dusk came, I returned empty-handed and again had no dinner. The third morning I was starving, but again Sir Caledon allowed only a small breakfast and sent me to the pond. Hungry, frustrated, and a bit angry, I set off. This time along the way, I convinced myself that yesterday's efforts were foolish. Of course the fish wouldn't be on the warmer side of the pond, they like cold water. Surely they would be closer to the eastern shore. So that is where I spent my day. Up and down the shoreline I went, casting my line, reeling it in, casting it again. By sunset, I had again caught nothing. This went on for two weeks. Each day I convinced myself that yesterday's notions were stupid and that today's idea should have been done all along. 
Each day I paced up and down one side of the pond or another, casting my line into the water over and over again, and each day I returned with nothing. I was losing weight and becoming sluggish. The effort of just walking to the pond every morning was tiring. Sir Caledon had noticed my condition as well, but if he were concerned about it, he did not show it. He stood firm in his instruction. Your dinner is at the pond, he said again, as I went off for yet another day of fishing. One morning I was on the north shoreline yet again, having made up some excuse for my previous failures, and certain today would be different. I began, as I always had, casting my line as I paced up and down the shoreline until around midday. Perhaps today wasn't going to be so different after all. Hungry, tired, and somewhat defeated, I finally sank down onto some rocks and just sat there staring out at the water. My mind was whirling through excuse after excuse for my failure. I made up reason after reason why the fish would be along this shore or some other. My newest theory was that maybe the fish were along this shore one day and along a different one the next, migrating in some sort of predictable pattern if only I could figure out what that pattern was. I sat there just staring into the water as if, looking hard enough, I would see some sign of where they were. Of course I couldn't. I'd been staring at this pond for two weeks. If there was anything to see, I'd have seen it by now. But there I sat anyway, just staring out at the water for I don't know how long. It was then that I heard some rustling noises behind the tree line off to my right. When I looked in that direction, I saw a boar poke its head out of the brush and begin to cautiously make its way to the water's edge. Shortly after, another came out of the brush from the same spot, and a third came a few seconds later. All three drank their fill from the pond and then disappeared back into the brush. I just sat there for a few minutes staring at them without even thinking, and then an idea finally hit me. Sir Caledon had said the cooks would prepare whatever I brought back. He did not say I had to bring back fish. I sprang to my feet and raced into the woods where I had seen them disappear. If I could catch one, I stopped running. I could do nothing. I had brought nothing with me to kill a boar. I would have to wait. No matter how much my stomach insisted on it, tomorrow I would come prepared. And the next day I did come prepared. When Sir Caledon sent me off, instead of a fishing rod, I gathered up some rope and a blade and set out toward the pond picking up some sturdy sticks along the way. When I arrived at the shore, I went to where I had seen the boar emerge yesterday and followed the tracks a few yards into the forest. There was a clear trail that they were evidently following to go to and from the water's edge. I immediately set about making my trap on that path. It didn't take long. The trap was crude, but it should work. I then retreated to the rocks I had sat on the day before and waited for what seemed to me an eternity, and it took all of my self-control to remain still when I heard the first rustling noises. If I moved now, I would scare it away. I had to wait for it to spring my trap. The first one emerged from the tree line unharmed. Frustration and anger took hold of me. My trap must have failed. I was seconds away from just charging after it with my blade when I heard the snapping of twigs and the squeals of another boar behind the trees. The one at the water's edge immediately ran off I know not where. I cared only about the one ensnared in my trap. I raced into the tree line and saw it was snared by the hind leg, thrashing about this way and that trying to break free and run. My trap had worked, but it wasn't strong, and it wouldn't hold this thing for very long before it broke. I had to be quick. I raced in, leaped upon its back, and drove my blade through its skull in one swift motion. I stood over its carcass, smiling with triumph. I would not starve tonight. I had not noticed how quiet the forest had become until I heard, It's about time. Spinning toward the unexpected applause, I found Sir Caledon sitting in a tree about 20 feet off the ground. You sure are stubborn, lad, he said, as he climbed down. I was beginning to wonder if you'd ever figure it out. He began to explain that there were two lessons to be learned from this. The first was, of course, patience. Had I not spent the days pacing up and down the shoreline scaring them off, I might have spotted these boars days ago. And of course, you cannot just run into the bush after a boar, no matter how much you want to. Your odds of catching it are pretty slim, and even if you do, barehanded, you've little chance of killing it. If you aren't prepared to do battle, whenever possible, it is better to wait until you are. Pushing bad circumstances generally leads to bad results. And the second lesson? Details, he said. Victory or defeat is often in the details. I told you your dinner is at the pond, he said. 
I did not say your dinner is in the pond. There are no fish in that pond. My initial reaction was rage. All along, he knew I was wasting my time fishing here and said nothing. I was just about to make another rash mistake, but I remembered his words when he first tried to teach me patience. If your enemy is making a mistake, it is better to stand aside and let him. He had given me the information I needed more than once. It was I who didn't listen. I was making the mistake. He merely stood aside and let me. If I were the enemy, he'd have already won the war without doing a thing. Clearly, I still had much to learn. After the patience lesson, things finally returned to what had previously been a somewhat normal routine for us. Schooling in the morning, fencing in the afternoon, and steady drills about chivalry in the evening. One day became essentially the same as the next, and after a couple of years of this steady repetition, my initial excitement for this new life began to wane. While my body grew stronger, my mind became bored again. The same lessons again and again. I could repeat them in my sleep at this point. I wasn't learning anything new anymore, and it bored me. But Zamara smiled again, and I didn't have to endure this boredom for long. In late spring, rumors of strange goings-on in a small mining village to the north called Galbrick began to reach Venturum. The garrison commander decided to send a small patrol up to Galbrick to investigate. Sir Caledon was chosen to lead this party, and of course, I went along as his squire. We were on the road north the next day. Once more, I had no idea what lay ahead of me, but I was excited to find out. 